the services that we offer at Citizens Advice are very much uh, office-based and face-to-face -face services. So we realized we need to do something to turn that into a fully integrated home-based provision um, pretty quickly. So because the needs of our clients have changed, we have already started developing uh, telephone services and email and to a lesser degree web chat, although up until about three weeks ago, these only accounted for about a quarter of our total service delivery. And the three key services that we offer in, in, in our local citizens advice are, of course, the advice service, which uh, uh, is usually in our own venues and in some community venues, and that uses, uses large teams of highly trained and skilled volunteers. Uh, we also do social prescribing services, providing coaching support on the phone and face-to-face -face in the community. And our volunteer community transport services, where volunteers use their own cars to drive people to primarily medical or hospital outpatient appointments when the client has no other means of transport. Also, having personally experienced economic crises resulting in food and fuel shortages when I lived in Zimbabwe, I was acutely aware that access to food and other essential items to, is, a, is a way to prevent social unrest and in this case health and safety rule breaking by people who should be shielded or self-isolating but will be driven out to find food or other supplies for themselves or their family and thereby place themselves or shielded family members at risk or indeed spread the virus if they are infected. Prior to this crisis, our advice service was already supporting many people who do not have access to food by being an agent that provides food vouchers to use at the local food banks after an assessment of a client's social needs, with interventions offered to address the issues that have caused the food poverty in the first place. And the main reasons for food poverty are not having money, which of course has only worsened in the last few weeks with people in insecure employment having less work and many people being laid off when initial lockdown actions occurred before the government announced financial support measures. We looked at how we would expand our community transport service to ensure that people who could not access food were able to. So initially we considered getting the volunteer drivers to do shopping for people who, who were self-isolating but there was a barrier which was how, we, how would we manage the payments without creating significant additional administrative work and financial risk as well as how to ensure the volunteers safety from cross infection if they were going about the shops and if they were uh, work, you know, going to individual people's homes. And this was when we spoke with Sophia about getting the free food parcels and using the volunteer drivers to distribute them to clients. Our medical expertise coupled with our specialist volunteer transport logistics experience enabled us to quickly implement the service. So from an idea on the 15th of March, we started delivering free food parcels on the 24th of March, only nine days later. And yesterday was day 16, and we've de already delivered 243 food parcels to 136 households across the whole of Cherwell. The food parcels are delivered efficiently by ensuring that drivers do the minimum mileage possible using our expertise in transport logistics. They're delivered safely as social distancing training and PPE is provided to ensure that the risk of cross-contamination is kept to a minimum. In fact, there is no physical contact between anyone at any point in the entire process from receiving the food parcels to delivering them to the doorstep of the client. It's delivered responsibly, so we ensure that the people requesting food parcels are genuinely in need of them, and we provide them with information about support that is available to ensure their ongoing financial, social, physical, and psychological well-being. The drivers who drop the parcels also do a welfare check, so they will wait a safe, a safe distance away to see if the client opens the door or waves at them through the window. And if they don't see the client, they will leave the food parcel but report to the depot staff, and then we will follow it up and, if need be, ask the client's emergency contact, which we get when we first sign them up, to go and check on them. And we also do it rapidly. So while we do ask people to give us as much warning of their need for food as possible, we're usually able to get a parcel to a client within 12 hours of taking the request. And where there is a priority, this can be addressed urgently. The service operates Monday to Friday, but will also be available on the weekends going forward because we anticipate that an increase in the demand for food will happen as people are using up their existing food supplies and, and many have not planned how they will get food going forward. They also may not realize how challenging shopping has become and, and may run out, they also may have run out of money. There are some other unique issues that have come to light, such as the number of elderly people who still use bank books instead of bank cards. So they can't make online or telephone purchases. They'd have
have to go into a bank to get. And additionally, some new groups who up until a few weeks ago were fully independent, but now find that they're unable to shop because of the, the, the risk of cross-contamination, such as visually impaired people. And of course, these people are not eligible for food bank vouchers, usual system. Initially, the government guidance was that anyone over the age of 65 and those with underlying health conditions, particularly respiratory illnesses, heart disease and diabetes, should self-isolate. But unfortunately, this included many of our volunteers, which reinforced the need to work from home. The government then issued a list of named people who should be shielded. And again, many people have been missed off the government's list despite meeting the criteria. And among them have been transplant patients, people with asthma, and some with rare lung diseases. Not being on the list has affected their ability to access food and medical supplies as they shield from the virus at home, unable to leave for at least 12 weeks or possibly longer. Uh, it seems now that supermarkets are using the government list to give priority to vulnerable customers for online shopping, meaning those not included have already missed out on opportunities for which they should be eligible. And if any one of you have tried to book an online shopping slot recently, you'll know that they are simply unavailable or there is a two to three week wait. Uh, probably even a three to four week wait. And this is particularly challenging when people live alone, but it's also problematic if they don't, because anyone living with them also has to self-isolate to reduce the risk to the high risk individual. So fortunately, our service has been able to be there for those who fall through these cracks or who simply do not have money for food. Additionally, for those not on the government list who are self-isolating, but who can pay for shopping over the phone, we've made an arrangement with the local co-ops that if the person calls, calls them, they will put their shopping parcels together, take a telephone payment, and our volunteer drivers will collect the food, the shopping, and deliver it to the person. And lastly, we're also preparing and putting bagged, freshly cooked meals on a table uh, for the street homeless in Banbury, who cannot prepare food as they have no cooking facilities. So it's been quite an accomplishment to rapidly transform our predominantly face-to-face -face services into fully digital services delivered as home working and, and, and also to establish the new uh, food parcel delivery service in less than two weeks. And incredibly, we've been able to maintain the level of support previously offered whilst responding to changing client and commissioner needs and of course, all the regulation changes. So what are the challenges going forward? Uh, I think there are a few key things. Number one, trying to plan. It is impossible to predict what happens next. Every day, some new challenge presents which needs resolving. And in fairness, everyone is having to respond in real time to issues as they present, and many are not predictable. The second thing is confusion about who is on the government priority list and who is not, because we need to identify the people in need of our additional support because they've fallen through the cracks. And the government list is driven by health conditions. So at this stage, it does not take social context or disability into consideration. I think the third thing are that leaders are not collaborating with each other. And nationally and locally, everyone is frantically setting up ways to meet needs, but not always doing this collectively. And this is resulting in greater confusion, duplication and gaps in provision. And this has an impact on frontline services that are already in place because the goalposts keep on moving. So two weeks ago, we were asked by the district council to deliver the government food parcels. And now it's going to be done directly by supermarkets. It's still unclear what role the, the RVS volunteers will play in Oxfordshire uh, when we already have so many effective systems in place delivering food, medicines, patient transportation and welfare checks. Yet people are still being directed to the Good Sam app for support and it is not yet linked with what we are doing. And finally, ensuring that we can afford to keep doing what we are doing. I have to say that a pandemic was certainly not in my budget for this year, so as much as we want to do everything necessary to support people through this crisis, we need to find the balance between helping now and having a service that will be able to continue in the future when people still need advice, social prescribing, support and community transport. And if we incur costs that we cannot afford, we risk the future of the organisation. We also need to renegotiate funding where service delivery has altered from the contracted agreement. So the challenge is on. We need to be innovative and not just to do things the way we've always done them. We need to work collaboratively and share resources rather than engage in a race for funding like the panic buying stockpilers did a few weeks back. I think that we need a longer term considered approach or we will simply exhaust ourselves and focus our energies on the wrong things and services will simply stop when the money runs out. So this is an invaluable opportunity for collaboration and participation for businesses to support the voluntary sector, to deliver the frontline work, to support people through this crisis. 
However, as a small charity, I do not have the resources or the connections to engage with larger corporations. But if a mobile phone operator offered us free or even discounted telephone and data minutes, then I would not need to scrabble to find money to cover the expenses that staff and volunteers are running up by working at home using their personal equipment and phone accounts when I'm also renting phones that are sitting in an empty office. Another thing is access to more laptops, tablets, or smartphones, because that will increase the number of volunteers who can help, or free or discounted fuel for volunteer drivers, which will enable people to keep delivering vital food and other supplies to those in need. I think that furloughed staff can help by volunteering to support people in their community by providing specialist skills and additional capacity. So we genuinely need to work together to make this happen, which is hard when we all feel like we're, we're running to catch up. Sadly, I do not believe that the world will return to normal in a few months' time. We will not be able to return to old ways of operating, and there will be new challenges that we have not even considered yet. But I think that there are also many opportunities that can come of this too, and, and I've certainly seen some of them, and, and uh, you know, even just the things we've done in the last few weeks are evidence of that. So I, I hope that you can too.